when we talk about food, we're talking about us. Food has become part of us. We process it, we do things with it, we change our being, we change our looks, we change our uh, genetic expression with it. And as, as those of you that have attended here before know that I like to haul on board one of my very favorite examples, and that is the Native American Indian. The Native American Indian, of which I treat uh, a fair number of families here, um, it is stark how current conditions have changed their entire being. My wife, uh, uh, who currently with my uh, two little girls, uh, well not so little anymore, um, is visiting my uh, in-laws in Sunnyside, Washington, right as we speak, uh, is exposed over there to an Indian tribe, there's a huge reservation over there, where the suicide rate of the Native Americans living there in the Yakima Valley is greater than 30%. The average lifespan of the American male there, or Native American male there, is 46. Yeah. The town that is right next to it, called Yakima, is the murder capital of the USA. It's an unbelievable place. Why is that? Because we look at pictures of these people from the 1880s to maybe 1910, right when the changes were about to occur, they're tall, they're lanky, they're good looking. They have these sinewy, lean muscle mass and they look good and they're very healthy and they lived a long time. It was not unknown for them to live into their 90s. These very same people with the very same genetic material have changed their entire being to becoming severely obese a diabetes rate of over 50%, catching everything that comes around. Yeah? Even their looks, they're pockmarked now. They have this, this, this very round face, which they never used to have. They're, they're apple-shaped. They're totally different. Their ancestors would not recognize them. Same genes, folks. Different environment. It is incredible the power we have over our genes and how they express themselves. Because research, when it really started taking off on genetics, it showed, well, this disease is due to this gene. And remember that, smoking, oh, you got this gene. Alcoholism, you've got this gene. No, not at all. Genes are maybe there waiting to be expressed. You just have to give it the chance to express. And we can shut off most of the bad genes with the foods that we're going to <coughs> talk about tonight. And you know what? You can do that in a matter of days. The new testing that we can do now, and we do some of it in our office as well, genetic testing, shows that you can shut off certain genes in a matter of days. Yeah, I said it twice for a reason. If you have a patient who's sensitive to one food, you, you get them out of that, and you switch it from McDonald's to mostly vegetables, phenomenal the changes that occur. So, let's talk about some of these things. The farmer's market, right down here, Fulton Street. Pictures courtesy of my oldest son. This is one of the stands. I love going Saturday mornings to the farmer's market. I hit it early because I'm a little impatient, I like to get in and out. And uh, it's, uh, and you get best, best pick, so 8 o'clock in the morning, be there and start interacting with people who grow your food. There is so much more meaning to your food if you know who grew it. If you know the little ins and outs. If you know that the dry season is making your blueberries a little bit more tart. Food becomes fun when you become knowledgeable of it. Trillin Farm Stand is one of the first ones down. Some of you might recognize that. Look at those tomatoes. <clears throat> Okay, these are all the different heirloom tomatoes. What can you do with these nice little ones? You know what? You cut them up. You let them soak in some balsamic vinegar. And you throw them onto some whole grain pasta. You grab some of the fresh basil you just bought, slice it up, throw it on there as well. If you're not allergic to, to cheese, get some goat cheese, feta, whatever you have. Put a few little slices on that. Chop up one of the sweet onions you just picked up. 
throw it through there. Guy like thing. Don't use a recipe. Just throw it in there. Lots of olive oil, and you've just got a great <coughs> meal. Your body loves this. Notice that broccoli. Everything is organic here. Everything is organic. And you know that broccoli, if there happens to be a cancer cell, the anthocyanins that are in there, a huge antioxidant, can stop your cancer dead in its tracks. It is amazing how anti-cancerous broccoli is. This stuff's been poo-pooed because studies have been done with cancer patients, and there's been rumor that broccoli might be anti-cancerous. So then they use it and don't change anything else, just give patients a broccoli extract, and it does nothing. Oh, broccoli's no good. You know, that's silly. That is really silly. Broccoli by itself cannot get a handle on out-of-control cancer. But it can certainly help promote anti-cancerous properties. Yeah, it's one of the continuum of many things you should be using. Okay, the garlic lady. <laughs> it's not garlic you see here, by the way. But she is quite famous for her garlic. She has all these varieties of garlics. And I buy garlic there for the entire year. I just buy huge bunches of it. Um, it's all hanging in the kitchen. It looks kind of crazy. Um, but it's fun. And they're all different shapes and colors. And uh, we just keep buying it. And uh, she's always rubbing her hands. And nice. she sees me coming because I know I'm going to grab a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> And these are some of her heirloom tomatoes. These are tomatoes that have not been hybridized. Uh, they're native. Uh, they taste absolutely terrific. They're beautiful to look at. I love putting them on a bowl, on a countertop, in the kitchen, and just show them. The light shines, up, shines on them. It's prettier than flowers. Yeah? Food is decoration, but also as food. And some of the most beautiful ones that I almost dare not eat. Uh, and the taste. Wow. And it is cheaper than going to the grocery store. Yes? So these are some of the sweet onions. Uh, sweet onions. Uh, uh, my brother and uh, my brother-in-law and sister in the Netherlands uh, have a huge onion business. Um, so they're always checking out the onions over here, and it definitely passes muster. I must tell you that it passes muster to such a degree that they don't import the onions over here. My only young Uncle John in back in the Netherlands, he is now hitting ninety and still bicycles every day. He's extremely active. He's a farmer and is very independent, and he claims his longevity is he eats an onion for breakfast raw every morning. <laughs> and you know what? I really doubt it. I don't. The effects on health are incredible. Extremely anti-cancerous. Thins the blood a little bit, so prevents heart attacks and strokes. We all know that garlic and onion is, boosts the immune system tremendously. I've never known Omi Young to be sick, ever. He also has a very... Um, relaxed attitude about life, and I think that's, of course, huge as well. He just sits back and enjoys everything and raises his pigeons on Saturdays, and he's always letting me know what his pigeons did, and they're usually doing pretty well. You know? you know? Pigeon racing is really big in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and here I, you don't hear much of it. I, uh, okay. So this is my Saturday haul that I put on, on the countertop. Uh, and this feeds a family of seven for a week. Yeah, uh, We are a very much a vegetable-based family. Uh, vegetables is the highlight. Uh, we make sure we involve the kids in our vegetable shopping. I usually try to drag one or two or three of my kids along to the farmer's market. Not always successful, mind you. Um, and, uh, but as a reward, they get to pick out some of these things, except the funny thing is, I was going through these on Saturday, and uh, uh, my youngest one, Talia, was looking at these, and she goes, she knew she was going to get me in this one, she says, I don't like any of those foods. And I said, Talia, what about this? Well, yeah, okay. And then, um, then she uh, piped up again, she says, I uh, really have to uh, get my taste buds back to school, don't, don't I? I said, yeah, that's her mom's favorite my wife's favorite saying to her, well, if you don't like this, then we have to basically bring your taste buds back to school and learn how to <laughs> like this. Just like with some of the subjects at school, it's not so easy in the beginning, but here we go, here we start with a few, and yes, your taste buds are now going to school and learning how to eat this. We're not always successful by you. Um, 
uh, she's my challenge as far as foods go. But um, uh, notice the peas. They're just terrific. They're, they're just phenomenal what you can do with them, the different kinds of onions, these tomatoes. You can get rid of prostate cancer with that. This is medicine right here. Uh, those beans, uh, that was dug out just the day before. Uh, notice the parsley, great. Uh, celery, uh, celery is one of the best antidiuretics out there. Uh, it, uh, very much used in congestive heart failure. Um, in fact, one of my patients came in today and uh, he has some heart issues and uh, he wanted me to review all his nutrients and three of the pills were a day were celery pills. I said, well, why are you taking celery pills? He says, well, it's good for my heart. I said, yes. Why not eat celery? Well, that was a foreign concept. <laughs> eat real food. It's so much better for you if you could do it. Um, so, uh, these potatoes. Potatoes are much maligned. Uh, potatoes can be extremely good for you when taken along with other foods. Yes, it's high in glycemic index when you peel them. But please, eat it with the peel. It's absolutely delicious that way. It creates better fiber that way. And the complex carbohydrates that are in there really aren't that bad when you don't do it to an, to an excess. Sweet potatoes are actually quite a bit lower on the glycemic index. So, so these uh, beets that you see sitting over there, Beets, everybody turns up their nose at beets. Beets are delicious. And they're not that difficult to prepare. Boil them, then peel them. Don't peel them beforehand, because you lose all the nutrients into the water and it's hard to it's hard to prepare them. But just 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 eat them. They're so good. Last time I mentioned that we often like to just take beets, slice them up, throw them on a cooking sheet, like a cookie sheet, intersperse it with carrots, sprinkle maybe a little bit of olive oil, some some sea salt on it, and Put it on 400 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour to hour and a half. The whole kitchen, the whole aroma just gets filled by this caramelized beet with uh, a carrot ratio. They kind of sweeten each other, they caramelize, and it makes an absolutely delicious dish. Cheap, nutrient laden, and easy. Yep. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'd like to try to specialize in easy. So we, we take questions afterwards. So this is your uh, community basket. So a lot of these places, like building farms, and there's many others, uh, uh, you can actually buy into their crop, and then every week you pick up your portion. This is a one week's worth for one person. And every week it's different. Uh, it's fun. Uh, it's not what I do, because some weeks I'm not there you know, doing seminars or whatever, so not convenient. If it's, but if you're there and, and you're, you're, you can steadily pick it up, this is the way to go. It's a huge money saver. Okay, so foodshed.net slash forward slash food guide is where you can find your local CSA so you can start doing this. There's some really excellent farms around here, <coughs> Lovers, Drilling Farm, think of it. Uh, they're all over, yeah. yeah. It's in, it's, I, I've got a national guide at home uh, for all the best farms for uh, uh, grass fed cattle, for instance, organic produce. Uh, uh, organic honey, uh, where the honey uh, hives are all surrounding organic uh, crops, <coughs> surrounded by organic crops. You know what? Right here in West Michigan, we are really fortunate. We're in a thick of it. There's so many of them right around us. And uh, it's, it's important to want to sustain the local economy, support these people, and, and get involved, and save a lot of money in the process. If you have doubts and what to do with food, doesn't matter, cut it up, put it together, stir fry it. It always works. I always, always put lemon through it. Lemon is one of the most underrated uh, things out there. Grate some onion in it or squeeze some lemon in it. It always spices it up. I always throw just a little bit of seafo seafood in it. Uh, try to put in uh, some slivered almonds perhaps. You can even afterwards put in some fruit like raspberries, don't, not in the beginning obviously, it gets too soggy, or slices of apple, and kids will absolutely love it, especially if you serve it over a bed of rice. So, what's freshest tastes best? Use season's first offerings to begin lighting up the summer. And you wanted to jump in on this one? So a lot of people um, that I get to counsel in the lifestyle therapy program, or they just come up and talk to me, whenever it works out, they'll say, well, how did you learn so much about food? It just came from, from being in love with food. And so um, what I started doing is I just found some great websites where they're really just focused on whole foods and just an enjoyment and 
an understanding of the nutrition that comes from local um, and hopefully organic food. Um, this is my big black book of recipes that I love. That's the technical term for it in my house. <laughs> So anytime I find something online, I print it up and I put it in this book. That way I'm not stressed about trying to go to a bunch of different cookbooks. And my big secret is I will get a cookbook from the library, go through it, copy a recipe or two that I love, and not buy a cookbook and have a ton of things on my shelf that I'm not going to use. That is except for my very favorite one. This thing just never ceases to provide. It's been two years I've been cooking out of this book, The Great American Detox Diet Book. It's got some great information in the first half of it, and then some fantastic recipes in the second half, and there is some incredible flavor in this book. And um, it's, it's not gluten-free per se. I do have to make modifications for that, but it is a vegan book. So I just always figure, as Americans, we don't need help learning how to cook meat. We need help learning how to cook vegetables. So that's right, do that. Now, um, one of my favorite websites is 101cookbooks.com. Do yourself a favor. This is beautifully written. She is a cookbook editor and also a photographer, so her food pictures are just beautiful, and it's very inviting and convinces you to try new things. Her education on different food groups, and maybe vegetables you've never thought of trying, makes it seem very accessible. Um, I have just learned so much. I'm a little starstruck. I thought about what if I met her, and I, was, I don't know what I would say, because I've learned so much from her. Um, so these are a couple of her recipes. Um, she has a spring minestrone that is just fantastic. That's in her book, Supernatural Cooking. And Doc will show a slide later that uh, gives you some information on that. And then tasty asparagus and brown rice is another thing. We're going to have both of those recipes on our website uh, for you to print up, so don't stress about that. But I just wanted to kind of get you thinking. Asparagus is typically the first thing that comes out of the ground. It's the first thing we see is kind of the herald of spring. And so I. Um, it, food just tastes the best when it's brand new. And so that's why I wanted to get you guys thinking about asparagus. And I'm sure my husband's back there laughing because up until two years ago, I would not eat asparagus. And he's been trying to get me to do it for years. And until I started getting it local in the season, I never, um, I never wanted to eat the woody stalks and the, oh, it's so gross. But when you get it fresh at the farmer's market, and put it in some of these recipes, it's and really, really good. We like to barbecue ours. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you mean grill? Yeah. You don't mean the barbecue sauce. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, what, what we do is we put it up at, at a, a pan that has perforations in it, and then you just line them up, and I throw olive oil on it before the fire is on, and, and then you sprinkle a little bit of sea salt on it, and you, you got to kind of keep moving around. I do it with my fingers, just really quickly do that until you get the very slight markings on it. It is unbelievable how well that tastes. Uh, it really is. And then we can throw that on a salad or whatever yeah, we do with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's easy. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. You want to turn the page for me? Wonderful. Okay, so I was just, as I was sharing, some of my most inspired or inspiring whole foods cookbooks and websites, The Great American Detox Diet, which I was just saying. Did anyone see Supersize Me, the documentary about the guy who, yeah, this is his wife. And this is, um, she's a vegan chef. And so um, Alex and Alexis, I think is her name, um, she is the one that put together the detox diet for him to recover from eating this McDonald's diet for 30 days. So if that kind of tells you, I mean, we're talking about detoxification and how to repair yourself from the standard American diet. And I don't know if you can see, but the front is like a French fry container, except there's vegetables in it. <laughs> so it's a little cheesy, but it's so true. Um, so um, I'm very sorry that Supernatural Cooking is on two lines. My editing is a little messed up there, but it should be the second one down is Supernatural Cooking by Heidi Swanson, who I just think is fantastic. The Healthiest Meals on Earth, The Surprising and Unbiased Truth About What Meals to Eat and Why is my new favorite cookbook. There's a lot in here about in defense of good fats and all that kind of stuff, so this is really, and the pictures, again, really inspire me to try a lot of things. They talk in here about the poly meal, just how to balance a meal with as many nutrients as possible, and so I've been learning a lot about that, so this is really helpful. Um, and then Heidi Swanson's food blog is 100.com. <coughs> so those are my those are my favorites. Awesome. <laughs> Talking about good fats, that reminds me of one fat that is uh, very underutilized and always brings. Uh, uh, I raise eyebrows uh, to whoever I say this, and that is ghee. 
clarified butter, one of the best fats on earth. It's totally dairy free because the dairy proteins have been out of it. It's just the fats that are left. Uh, yes, it's a saturated fat, but it's a very short carbon chain, so it does not clog up your arteries. In fact, it clears it. It tastes terrific. It's native to India, it's where we use it, and they have fats over there, over there that they actually age. It never goes bad on you. And it becomes a family heirloom. Some of these geese are over 100 years old. Yeah? Now, you don't have to do this, but buying clarified butter, which you can do, Harvest Health and other places has it. I believe also Fort Hill Foods. So I'm sure it's available in many other places. Uh, you can use this as a cooking oil. It has a very high, what we call, smoke point, so it doesn't burn quickly. It's absolutely delicious if you have, like to eat bread, some good bread, and put it on there. Uh, and you can just leave it on your countertop as long as you don't put a dirty knife or spoon in it, which will put breadcrumbs in it, and that could go moldy then. Uh, as long as you keep it clean from contaminants, it will not go bad on you. So it, this is a wonderful little thing that you can put on the... Uh, uh, on your uh, countertop and not worry about it too much except keep the kids from making it dirty. So, so uh, that's my thing on fat. Um, there's also one other thing before I'm going to hand this over. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that is, uh, why are we, are we talking about this anyways? It is so critical. One, you've got the Native American example, right? But then there was another patient, uh, she's present here tonight, uh, who's doing, who just made a radical change, uh, and she comes to mind because she was one of my last patients to see uh, tonight. She's into an elimination diet. Uh, we're using something to detoxify her liver for some very <coughs> old toxins over there. And on the ninth day, it's like there's a, a, a new life. There is a new life. Clarity of mind. Brain fog is gone. The pain, the chronic pain discharges, she called them, in her body, gone. She just realized at the start. Those, those pains are gone. We're talking nine days into a change. The fatigue, chronic back issues, all those things are improved dramatically in just a few days, folks. It's amazing what you can accomplish by changing your diet. You can change your looks. You can change your moods. You can change your physical energy greatly. You can change just everyone around you because you're different. You're processing information different and thus reacting to the people around you differently. It benefits everyone. And it also benefits the growers that you're buying from. And it benefits the local economy. It's, it's, this is huge what we're doing here. So if you go to your local chain food restaurant, what seems cheap is actually extremely expensive. It's extremely expensive. The hospital bills are unbelievable. The cost per person, healthcare-wise, in this country is many times what it is in my home country. And not that they're that exemplary over there, but the functional lifespan there is considerably longer there than it is here. The cost per person healthcare wise is just a fraction of ours. Yeah? And that is because they are much closer to Earth as far as eating whole food than we are. So, um, we can buck this natural trend. It starts right here. And I know healthcare changes are supposedly coming. But they're just trying to change it through what we call national health care, nationalized health care and insurance and a big umbrella to cover everybody and cover their needs. But you know what? It's us that has to change. It's not the government. It's us. It's us that should require no health care, if, if at all possible. So uh, having said that, a community garden is a great way to, uh, to roll and start into this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, some of this was inspired. You know, as we were talking about how to change lifestyle, how to detox, how to declutter, um, one of the things that I thought that was very inspiring about talking about gardening is how the Obamas are putting in a garden. And it's been years since they've had a garden in the White House. And one of the things that she said is one, to teach her children, which is great. And it's also going to inspire their flavors of Mexican foods to help when they're entertaining guests, that they're going to be eating something that they've planted and something that is organic in nature. So we thought that's really great. Um, this is a local community garden here. Um, I think, yep, 425 Eastern Avenue Southeast. I thought I put it down there. Um, back when, if anybody remembers Brooke, this is one garden that she used to like to, to go visit. So this is something that you can do inside a city locale instead of a country locale. So there might be a couple people that get together to use somebody's backyard to make a garden. That's an option. 
or for those apartment livers, there are the window gardens. <laughs> Your voice is talking. <laughs> it's so weird. But anyways, so this is this is a wonderful, wonderful way to just look at gardening. Um, a couple. I know we're going to talk about some fruits here and some fish and seafood farther down the line. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but what we're going to talk about is different foods that you can grow in you know, a country setting compared to a city setting. For those apartment dwellers or somebody with a smaller backyard, herbs are easy. They're so simple. Um, we like dill. We like parsley. Um, garlic can grow very, very well in the um, little window garden. Also, tomatoes are awesome. I mean, who hasn't been able to get a big, huge amount of tomatoes? from just one little plant. So I mean, looking at the expense of a garden is, is large when you look here as well, um, because for the cost that it takes you to go out to the grocery store and buy what you would need for a week's worth of vegetables, you can make for a fraction of the price at your own home with a little bit of work. Um, I was reading about a young lady who said that, you know, they're on a, a fixed income, so this year she spent $100 and put in a vegetable garden in her backyard. She says that's about what it would cost us for about maybe two to three weeks worth of food for vegetables for them, for their family. In the grocery store, she says, you know what, I'm going to get a whole summer's worth of food for a hundred bucks. You know, and that's excellent. And yes, there are, you know, right now you're going to start out with the lettuces and the kales and the asparagus first and then you're going to start to get more variety later. So yeah, you're going to have to go to the grocery store to pick up a few things to, to flavor some of these first season vegetables with. But look at all the things that you're saving. Look at all the things that you get to. You know, it always tastes better when you grow it yourself. There's just something about that. It just tastes so much better when you grow it yourself. So these are different parts of this garden. Um, these are collard greens and tomatoes. Obviously, the one is not a tomato. Um, but looking at different things that we can grow, I know uh, most people, for a beginner gardener, most people will start out with your tomatoes. Try to shoot for the heirlooms. One, they're prettier. They taste a lot better. There is so much more flavor to them. Now, shelf life on an heirloom tomato is half of that on, say, your cherry tomatoes or other tomatoes for slicing. Those are about 10 days. Heirlooms are about five. Best if, because um, they still ripen after you pick them, best if you keep them out of sunlight, but out of the fridge, because the fridge will make them go bad faster. Um, kale is also another one that's very easy to grow, wonderful, wonderful for flavor. Um, curly kale is the most common that you're going to see in stores. You want to be careful looking for wilting or any yellowing on the kale because that means it's, gonna, it's gone bad. And you know at the store where they always have the water shooting down on the vegetables? Before you get it home, if you have a salad spinner, throw it in the salad spinner and get it as dry as possible. Put it in an airtight bag. Um, if you have any water in the bag, it will encourage it to decay faster so you won't get the five day shelf life time out of it. So different things that you, know, you can kind of learn as you go along. Um, now this is, I was talking to Dr. Denver about if, whether or not they compost, because I started composting this year. I'm very excited about this because I wanted to use my own compost to make my own garden, which is going to be next year because my compost isn't ready. But um, so simple, so easy. And, and think of all the garbage that you're saving. I started recycling this year and I started composting. So I think I go through, for myself, maybe a bag of trash a month is, is what I end up with, uh, with all the recycling and the composting. And mind you, I have horses, so my compost goes in with the horse piles. So my compost turns over a little faster than others. Um, it's not necessary from, you know, everybody has told me, oh, you have to turn your compost, you have to turn your compost, get air in it. And I found that that really isn't as true as, as what I had thought because I was going to go out there with my pitchfork and start turning it over. And it's not necessary. Um, it, it will take a little longer to compost and it'll take um, about 8 to 12 months from what I found out for composting to get the good solid green, dark dirt. But hey, it'll work for us. So other things that um, we had talked about for growing things in the garden. Broccoli is something that, you know, what you see on the shelf in the store is really not how it looks when you grow your own garden. It looks the more seeded. Um, anybody a member of a CSA? I've got a few hands. Um, CSAs are wonderful. If nobody's ever tried one and you really want to look into something like that, um, some of the seasons are 
some of the places are full. I know Trillium Haven is already full for their CSA, but there are <coughs> other community-supported agricultures around that still have some openings. That's a good place to kind of get a good first view. Um, on range, they can run anywhere from a low end of, for a half bushel for one person, to a full bushel of $325 to $600 for um, the whole season. Season usually runs somewhere May through October, depending on your grower. And the basket that Dr. Denmore had showed here, this is a lot of the stuff that you're going to get, depending on what your CSA has, whether they just do vegetables and herbs, or if they do fruits and vegetables and herbs, will depend on what your basket looks like. But this gives you, I did a CSA for two years, I'm doing another one this year because I won't have my garden in. But this is such a great way to get used to eating different foods that you're not used to. I ended up with so much Swiss chard the first year. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so you learn how to make that stuff because you spent a lot of money on it and you're not throwing it away. So, and, and you know, the honest to goodness truth about the CSAs is, is the people that grow it, they know so much about it and they have wonderful, wonderful ideas, wonderful, wonderful recipes on how to cook it. You just can't go wrong if, if you're not really into really growing your own as of yet. But a CSA is a great way to start getting in touch with you know, different vegetable lifestyles. Now, the CSA basket there was um, a basket for, it's a bushel basket, so it was for two people is what they recommended serving, or one vegan. So that was um, more of, for a vegan for us. Okay, so we're also gonna talk about some top fruit picks, and I'll let Doc jump in here a little bit with these um, different things that you're gonna find. I did wanna touch on the tomatoes that I know a lot of people are, you know, questioning whether fruit, <laughs> vegetable, fruit, vegetable. Um, doesn't really matter. It really matters what it has in it. And the lycopene is one of the things that we're finding through research helps support our, our bodies so much. It helps prevent prostate cancer. It's one of the hugest things that they're, they're starting to see with it. The broccoli, the kale, your cruciferous vegetables, as Dr. Denmore had said, also have um, quite a bit of cancer preventing compounds to them. Huge sulfur in them. And sulfation is one of the processes that your liver goes through for detoxification. So it's wonderful to help the liver detoxify. So just a couple things that really stand out for us. So I'll let you go with fruits if you would like. The uh, raspberries and uh, also the blackberries that are in this um, in this family. Um, uh, wow, uh, the equivalent of four raspberries a day will cut your colon risk by 48 percent colon cancer risk. If there was a drug that did that, you think it would have lines? Just four of them a day. The antioxidants in them, it's incredible. And they taste good. This is not work. This is not work. So I feel very strongly that uh, 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 we need to load up on these things. Uh, blueberries are very much in the same family. Blueberries are known to brighten the mind incredibly. It is our haven against Alzheimer's. Very mind protective. But on anyone, it will sharpen your mind. It's a great way to start your day. We, uh, just just last week I was in the store and I said, oh, the frozen blueberries, I wonder how much that is. There was a little bag, but I don't remember how much it was, uh, pound-wise, maybe half a pound. Uh, but it was $5.49 for frozen blueberries. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm really saving a lot of money because I put 130 pounds in my freezer from the farmer's market. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's so easy to do. I am uh, a little st uh, stingy with my time, uh, so I tried to really load up at the organic blueberry place at the farmer's market one or two days after it has rained. You know why? <laughs> one, they're a little plumber, but number two, I don't have to wash them. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you, you gotta you gotta wash them and you gotta put them on towels to them and dry, and then you can load it into into uh, into bags. No, I just want a meal to go. Because somebody holds the bags and somebody holds the thing and they just blah, blah, blah. That's how we get 130 pounds in the freezer and we're still enjoying that today. I have mine every morning. And occasionally I find a bag of blueberries or raspberries, blackberries, and I just throw it all in with my steel cut oatmeal. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, homemade uh, uh, freezer jam, which we make without cooking. Also very quick, we have uh, 68 Big jars of strawberry jam in the freezer, um, and uh, how many got 
have left now, but but it's 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 an incredible time savings because I did the math. One of my big bags of blueberries is about a buck. It's about a buck. <coughs> so it's just a fraction of the cost, and it's local, and it's good, and freezing diminishes the nutrients by only about 15 percent. So you're really not losing that much on this, and it's again easy. And so and Doc, yes. For those of you that don't have as big of families and, and you're just starting out, like college students or single, it, it's fun to go out and find out what seasons they are to pick. Um, I do the blueberry picking every year. We've done strawberry picking, and um, this year we're hoping to hit the raspberry season, which we've missed the last two years. But I mean, those are different ways. I think I stored. 15 pounds of blueberries in the freezer, and I think I have another 10 of strawberries. So, and it's awesome because then I get to have those fresh fruits every morning throughout the winter when yeah. I otherwise wouldn't be able to have those. And it's fun going out and talking to people as you're picking them. And, you know, in the blueberry patches, they have these bird calls that go off, or owl calls, or whatever they are. And every once in a while, they're like, whoa, what was that? Yeah. You know, and it's just kind of funny. You've got this belt strapped on you in this big old bucket, and you're just picking blueberries as you go. So it's just fun to actually get your hands in there and do it yourself, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So pineapple, the bromelain is good for inflammation and infections. One of the compounds we use here in the office of is zymane. It's high concentrated pineapple. That's all it is. It is extremely anti-arthritic and it's a good digestive enzyme. Pineapple can be very good for you. Not too much, obviously, because the sugar content is quite high. You do have to be careful with fruits, especially if you're, uh, if you have to worry about your uh, sugar levels. But uh, believe me, it's a whole lot better than sugar is. Uh, kiwi is uh, one of our biggest uh, vitamin C promoters. It's extremely high in vitamin C. It's in one of the top three fruits that we know of. Uh, papaya has proteolytic enzymes for digestion and chymopatia for reducing inflammation of lung health. We used to have something here called papaya, this is about 20 years ago. I can't get it anymore, it's a German product, but its main ingredient was just plain old papaya. And it helps digest the problem immensely. Okay, I love papaya for that reason, and it tastes good. So then there's also a debate, well, if it's not organic, I should buy it, or organic is so expensive. Yes, it is. One of the worst foods that I think you can buy is organic junk food. <laughs> in fact, as Michael Bowen likes to say in his books, the word junk and food shouldn't even go together. Okay, junk food is not food. Yeah, it's something, it's something that can go inside of you, but it's not food. And what you get out of it is junk. Junk food, whether it's artificial, uh, junk food, whether, whether it's organic or not organic, it doesn't really matter, folks. It's still junk food. It's bad for you. And the biggest mistake people do with their budget is to buy all their cereals and all their foods that are processed organically. That is so expensive and so ridiculous. Don't do that. Yeah? Just get rid of processed foods. All together. Can you imagine walking into an organic McDonald's? It still would be. <laughs> yeah. So, so don't don't do that. Uh, then the question is, well, organic produce versus local produce. Local produce will win every time. Yeah, because your organic produce, that the carrots that just got flown in from Florida. Where it got grown on a little more sandy soil than that rich soil compared to Michigan, will have that organic carrot, and I've seen a study will have one fifth the nutrients than your ordinary carrot from Michigan. One fifth. Yeah, not worth it. It's probably twice as expensive. Long shipping distance, organic farming uh, is, is difficult to do. Fresh trumps it in almost all cases. So fresh is really important. If you can get fresh and organic, now you've got the whole thing going because organic has lots more micronutrients and uh, its vitamin content is often up to threefold the quantity. Yeah, this is important. Plus, it hasn't been genetically hybridized and changed. So, if you can get from a local stand organic and local, you've got the best thing going. Yeah, pretty simple, right? Okay, here's some um, ideas for where you get the uh, 
this is my, my, my very favorite author, where you get some uh, recipe ideas and food ideas. I'm the first lemon and in defense of food. Those are two different books, Michael Pollan. It's just a joy to read and it gives you a bit of a foundation of where food comes from and what we should do with it. And uh, that, those, uh, those are both bestsellers and a very, uh, a very good read and uh, they'll make you understand uh, why we shouldn't be eating all the corn products and, and all the, for example, he devotes three chapters, I think, on corn alone and how it becomes, how it's become part of the government and defense industry and how we make oil from it and how the government subsidies to the corn farmers has created such an overwhelming flow of corn that we try to put it into everything and it, it just, it goes on and on. It's, it's very interesting to study all this. Okay, the safest fish to eat. We get this question a lot. King salmon, coho salmon. So the salmons, the sardines. Sardines, I uh, often get raised eyebrows at that. You know, you can just chop those up, throw them over salads. You can mash them together. It actually tastes quite, it's quite tasty. And it's one of the very few foods that contain vitamin D. I see I've convinced a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> Anchovies, flounder, Pacific sole, and light canned tuna. Light canned tuna, not more than twice a week. Okay, farm raised is a very distant second. It comes nowhere in comparison to wild. Farm raised, if you've visited a farm for fish, you will not eat it. <laughs> yeah, they've got pools about the size of this room, all netted in, and there's, uh, for about every, there, there's fish almost right next to each other. It's just really dirty water, and once to, or twice a day, they'll throw in feed that is pesticide laden, loaded with antibiotics and also chemicals to keep out the fish lice because otherwise they all die of disease. It's just pathetic. In fact, the flesh is from a salmon is gray. They add colors to the food so it can appear pink. And this is not appetizing, folks. And it's nowhere near the natural thing. So it's really, I hope I've turned you off enough towards, oh, towards this kind of uh, fish because it really is a very distant second. But all of the farm raised fish, the best ones, the cleanest ones, are striped bass, rainbow trout. They can use less chemicals with them because they're not quite as disease prone. And here it goes down. But notice the mussels, shrimp, scallops, and oysters. Those are bottom feeders. And bottom feeders don't tend to be very clean either. There's a lot of pollutants. And watch where they come from. If they're from China, you don't want them because they've been harvested next to their cities, which have the highest pollution counts in the world. Heavy metals are very prevalent in them. So watch where they come from. Yeah? I noticed in Sam's Club the other day that there's actually Alaskan salmon that's wild, it's frozen, and cheap. It's very cheap. A big box that contained a dozen pieces was a tall dollars, which for salmon is very cheap. Um, so you can do it at a fraction of cost if you're smart. So don't do these more than once a week due to heavy metals. Can white tuna, mahi tuna, or mahi mahi cod, white fish, and Alaskan king crab. And stay away from these. Um, sea bass is in there simply because of its high mercury content and its endangered uh, um, uh, status. Uh, same with swordfish. The salmon uh, from farmers are absolutely, you don't want to eat those. So here we get into some issues that I feel is very critical to all this. Very critical. Very critical. So, food club principles, take it away. <laughs> so, it is okay to say no to certain things in your life, and you know, the biggest question here is what type of life when we were growing up, where we're at now, did we see for ourselves? Um, are we at where we want to be? You know, a lot of a lot of what I'm gonna talk about has to do with decluttering and whether that's your house, your lifestyle, your job stress, or the fat in our body. That's what this is going to talk about. Um, a lot of this, I really love this book. <laughs> I picked it up not too long ago. Does this clutter make my butt look fat? <laughs> what a great title. I mean, how can you not like this title alone? Um, the author, Peter Walsh, he is one of the guys that helps out with Clean Sweep. If anybody's ever seen that <laughs> show, I do believe it's on HDTV. Sorry, I don't have cable, so I don't really know. Um, so, but he, he talks about how when he first wrote his first book about how to declutter your house, he got so many letters flushed back into him about how just cleaning the clutter in their house helped people lose weight. And he researched that principle a little bit more. And some of the 
food clutter principles that he found were just the basic, imagine the life that you want. Think back, whether that has to do with, you know, say we're stressed at work. Think about the absolute most best place that you would ever want to work. This is my dream job. This is where I want to be. Put that on your list. Okay? Could be also, what type of house do I want? Where do I want to be? You know, and you know, when he talks about decluttering the house, he says, go to a room, look at it, and say, what did I imagine for this room? If something's in there that doesn't fit that principle, it goes. So how to get rid of things as well. Um, there was also another study that was done in the New York Times on hoarders. And what they found is when they asked a hoarder about different things in their life and they would pick up a personal item property and they had them hooked up in different parts of the brain looking at what their brain went through and they asked them to keep or throw it away and if they chose to throw it away it would be shredded so then they knew that it was a permanent decision there was nothing else going on well the ones that ended up saying throw it away and they realized it was a permanent situation that went on one part in the brain always went off and it was the limbic system and the limbic, limbic system in the frontal lobe that went off there. And, and you could see that it just really stressed them out to let go of that piece of property. And after they did that for so many pieces of property, they found that the people would become less and less stressed and they wouldn't feel like there was so much on their plate. Same thing happens in our life. Um, one of the th things that they talk about is the reason why we store things is to hang on to memories or other reasons for hanging on to, you know, why do I want to remember this? Is this from a brother that passed on or my grandparents or whatever? You know, it talks about in the book that sometimes those things we just need to let go. We like to go by the one-year system. You know, Goodwill commercial? Like the Goodwill commercial? If you haven't worn it for a year, get rid of it. Same thing in the house, unless it's for a special occasion. If you haven't used it in a year, get rid of it. And the biggest place to start here is in the kitchen. The kitchen is the best place because if you want to cook and you want to eat there, it has to be a safe haven. It has to be some place that you enjoy to be. Okay? So organizing where, how, and what you eat. Where am I going to eat it? How am I going to eat it? What is it going to be? This takes planning. Okay? Identify your goal for your body. It doesn't necessarily have to be a body type or size, this could be health issues as well. You know, I don't want to hurt my knees. I don't want to have headaches. Those kind of things, okay? If it isn't healthy, colorful, and part of your plan, don't eat it. I really, really love the picture back after the CSA basket of everything that cut up that you can make into stir fries. I have a hard time making food that looks just blah. If it's white and brown or white and one other color, I can't eat that. It's just boring. So to me, I put a lot of color everywhere. And I love spice. So I, I do the Denbor idea, and I just throw stuff in. <laughs> and you know what? If it doesn't taste good, I'm still going to eat it because it's just me. <laughs> so I'm not hurting anybody else. <laughs> Talk about spice. Make sure your spices are not over a year old. Very true. Uh, that's that's one, of the, one of the biggest things is go through your spice drawer. Uh, have lots of spices in there, by the way. Uh, use fresh whenever possible. And uh, if it's uh, over a year, it gets musty. It starts losing its, its flavor. Uh, it actually will ruin your food. Get rid of it. Spices should not ever be older than a year. Um, it's one of the first things you should try to declutter. Very true. So fat doesn't appear overnight, and it's not going to disappear overnight. So this is something that's going to take time. It's the same with when we work on decluttering our bodies and decluttering our homes. It's not going to be all done in one day. It's going to take a while. We're going to have to think about things and, and find out a way to say goodbye if it's something that we think that we don't need but we still cherish memories with. Live in the present, not in the past or future. This one is so true. So those, one of his biggest things in the book is he's like, you know, we store a lot of things in our house that we don't use. Like those skinny pants that we hope to get into or the baggy clothes that we once had just in case we flux weights or whatever. He says, you know, get rid of them. You live in the past or in the future. Let's live right now. Where am I at right now? Because you know what? That'll push you to a goal that you want to be at, especially for when we're looking at health. Focus on enjoying the next meal. This is one thing that I think all of us can work on. We a lot of times are on the go. We have a busy schedule. Did we ever think about what we were going to do for that lunch that we're on the go through or that we have a working meeting? 
you know, those kind of things. And one of the other things that I thought was very critical is multitasking. One of the sections of the book talks about don't multitask while you eat. Be present with what you eat. Look at it. Taste it. Chew it. Feel the texture. You know, yeah, we can converse with family, but don't be reading a book. Don't be talking on the phone. Don't be watching TV. Those kind of things. Just be present with what you're doing. Um, make mindful eating a way of, way of life. And that is what mindful eating is. It's actually thinking about what we're eating. Think out your meals. Verbalize what is important and make good choices. This comes down to more meal planning than anything. And, and coming down to how many meals am I going to be eating at home? How many am I going to be cooking? How many am I going to take with? Um, bigger is better if you're cooking and you want to make sure that you have extras for leftovers. Um, I get a lot of questions about what do you eat for breakfast? Many days, honestly, it's what I had for dinner. I'm not picky. I don't really need steak and eggs or whatever it is now for I think my mom's favorite is breakfast. For breakfast is eggs and toast and bacon. Um, I don't really eat those anymore. I've, I've moved away from what I had in my childhood and eat more of the steel cut oats with blueberries or I love a quinoa mix with nuts. Everybody know what quinoa is? Yeah. Oh, sorry. What? <laughs> quinoa is a gluten-free grain. It has all the amino acids to make a protein. Absolutely wonderful. It cooks up with one cup of quinoa to cook two cups of water. 20 minutes, it's all done. It has like these little white curlies that fool around. You know, very, very good. Um, you can mix it with anything. It's good cold or hot. I think it's probably my favorite with cucumbers and tomatoes. When cucumbers and tomatoes are in season with balsamic vinegar and a little Celtic sea salt. Oh, to die for. Quinoa is also one of the richest sources of proteins. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. It's almost all protein and cheese. Q-U-I-N-O-A. O-A. Okay. So there's two things now we want you to try, ghee and quinoa. <laughs> Got two. Okay? And recognize and celebrate every meal you enjoy. These are important. Now, Tina is one of our, our biggest supporters of these kind of things. Um, I'm going to ask her to come up and talk a little bit about another book that we really think is is great for decluttering and really helps her along her way. Sure. Um, so a lot of people that I was you just hold it for me. Oh, um, a lot of you know that I was a patient first before I came to work at DC. So um, when I do the lifestyle therapy program, I am very, very compassionate with people who are trying to overhaul their entire life. Because that's what I had to do. So whether it's decluttering your house or decluttering your heart, I guess for lack of a less cheesy word. Um, I was a, a business owner, a, I guess I'd say a workaholic, someone who did not let go of things very easily, and I actually had to do some work in that area before I really could get healthy physically. So we're serious when we talk about this kind of thing as being important, um, not just how it relates to food, but there was this book, and I just wanted to share, it's called Sink Reflections. If any of you have struggles with what this lady calls the chaos syndrome, which is can't have anyone over syndrome. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, no. and now, as a, as a business owner, I was used to being taken seriously, I took myself seriously, but my house was a disaster. And, you know, I still struggle with flashback moments. But um, I think that I had such high expectations of myself for being able to tackle everything that I was really unkind to myself in an area where I didn't have uh, I didn't learn well growing up. I didn't quite know what I was doing. I'm just, I, I was not a natural homebody. So um, this just does sort of a baby step program with how to set yourself up with routines that help you tackle the overwhelming clutter and also keep up with the day to day. And I guess the reason I recommend it, not because I think a lot of people have problems with that, although it would be helpful for that, but also because it just kind of built the groundwork, I think, for me to be gracious with myself in relearning all of these habits of food. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that I see in the lifestyle therapy program is um, the, the fact that even to all people who are intelligent and so successful in so many areas of their lives, it is not a no-brainer that to add healthy eating, to add healthy planning, something has to go. You would think that would be obvious, but it isn't. We try to pack that into our lives on top of everything else, and it doesn't work. And so then people feel like a failure because they can't get all those vegetables in that day, or you know they, they cracked and had junk food because they didn't set themselves up for success. So we have to make room for it. Um, and one of the most poignant times for me was 
gosh, I think I've been a patient for six months and then worked here for maybe 18 months before I realized I had to get rid of all my cookbooks, you know, all my old cookbooks. And I did still make a couple copies of my favorite things and put them in the big black book of recipe book, <laughs> recipes that I love. Um, but I actually had to call my mom and ask for permission. You know, I did it. I felt like I needed to do that. To, I, and I sat, my husband will attest to this, I sat for probably three hours and went through, oh my goodness, I remember when I made my first cheesecake with my mom and I dumped it down the stove. And, you know, I had all these memories and I went through the whole thing and I relished that and I grieved the fact that I wasn't going to cook that way anymore. Because it's still a loss. Even though it's a good change, you're still losing something. So then I called my mom and begged her forgiveness. <laughs> and then she blessed me and I threw it all out and I kept a couple things and I still have those memories, you know? But I think we just, we hold on to some things without realizing why we're holding on to it. And I think we can honor the people and the traditions in our lives and yet still be moving toward healthy choices. And that, man, that's taken me like two years to do that. It's not an all at once thing. And to think it is, is setting yourself up for failure. So um, whether you use a book like this, and, and um, this lady has a great history. She's called the fly lady because uh, I don't know if a lot of you have heard about um, using fly fishing as cancer therapy, breast cancer therapy, specifically for women. It has um, some really great science behind that. And so she's got a neat story, and she's just kind of talking about how to take her life back. So this was... Um, Marla, and I don't know how to say her last name. I don't know if it's silly, like C-I-L-L-E-Y, or if it's... Chili, either way, it's funny. Um, so she's called the Fly Lady. You can find it online, but this book was really helpful for me, and I know a lot of other people. So I'm very thankful for this place, of course, for getting me on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, there's a real strong psychological component to uh, uh, this stuff, and I appreciate you filling that in for us. Okay. So, big argument, and it costs too much. If you truly do this, you should save a lot of money, not just in your health care bill, but also in your food budget bill. Remember the huge no-no, organic junk food, okay? That will just break the bank every time. But what can you do for under a buck? Have you checked out steel-cut oats, how cheap they are? For a big canister, you can get one for three and a half bucks. Now, what's the difference between steel cut oats and rolled oats? Yeah? And steel cut oats are a little bit different in that you take the kernel itself and then take a steel blade and, go ch -ch 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 -ch, and just slice it up. You get these little hard kernels. Try to chew it, you'll break your teeth. You have to soak those overnight, at least that's what I do. I soak mine with hemp milk. Because hemp milk is one of the most nutritious, rich be beverage out there. It's got your good oils in it, got a lot of proteins in it, very nutritious minerals. It's an antioxidant and tastes good. So I soak mine overnight with it, and then you can pop it in the microwave or put it on a little, little pot, and within two minutes it's heated up and it's soft and ready to eat, and that's where I throw my frozen blueberries and who knows what else in there. That's breakfast. Yeah? The lignans that are in oats are very anti-cancerous. If you have one serving of oatmeal a day, steel cut oats, you have just lowered your cholesterol between 8 to 23% in just four weeks. It beats most statin drugs. And you're doing it without side effects. In fact, you're having multiple other good effects. Because it's low to glycemic index. The fiber in there helps normalize your estrogen levels. Excessive bad testosterone, which gives us prostatic hypertrophy, it gets lowered by this. That apple-shaped gut disappears with this. <coughs> under a buck. Yeah? Steel? First serving. Yeah. Steel. Yeah, steel cut. And I, I got an email today. Well, where, I can't find steel cut oatmeal. Where do you find it? You'll find it wherever oatmeal is sold. It's, just, it's, in, it's in there somewhere. Somewhere there is. It is it. I have to reply to, uh, on that one yet. But it's not it's not no packages oftentimes, you're right. It's not in these ready-made packages. So what's the difference between that? Well, you can also roll out oatmeal. And then you get your traditional flakes. Yeah? And that breaks up the fiber. It's also good for you. But it's higher in the glycemic index because you break it down quicker and you sugarize it quicker with it. 
It's not going to hold you over quite as well. Yeah? And then you get the almost instant oatmeal, and then they just did some chemical chlorination. I don't know what they all do with it, but they take most of the fiber out. It instantly performs for you as far as preparation goes. And it's also very icky for you as far as your glycemic index. And that doesn't have nearly as many health benefits. Right, still a lot better than Fruit Loops. You <laughs> see, the more we process it, the worse it gets. So let's leave man's hand out of it. Let's, let's, let, let God's hand prevail on this one. Yeah, it is really the way to go. Eggs, it's one of the best proteins out there, one of the most complete proteins out there. And how much is it per <coughs> egg? It's unbelievably cheap. Now please buy the organic or free range eggs. Because the oils in there are totally different. The taste is much better. It has less inflammatory material in it. And the whole cholesterol issue with eggs has been laid to rest long ago. Kale. One of the most nutrient-rich vegetables out there. A bunch of kale will cost you a buck or less. Kale is incredible for its anti-cancer properties. It prepares easily. I like to steam mine lightly. Um, you can certainly put it in water, but you'll lose a lot of nutrients. It does not work well to saute it. Steaming is the way you prepare it. It is not an acquired taste. It tastes really quite good. And yes, I've been known to put it on a grill even. I'll throw anything on a grill. Yeah? And it, it works. It gets kind of a smoky flavor, and through the salad, it's, it's phenomenal. Potatoes. Sweet potatoes and yams are lowest in the glycemic index. Glycemic index, again, remembers, is, refers to how fast it does the sugar thing up and down, which is very important. But potatoes themselves, when you leave the peel on, is extremely healthful, good fiber, multiple health benefits. They say it's one of the few foods that you can actually survive on and eat nothing else. It's one of the few foods. So that tells you something. Uh, if you have those little shoots coming up, please cut those off. They are poisonous. Yeah, this is important. <coughs> apples. A little bit disturbing factoid about apples. I'm about to ruin a good thing here, but it's 50% cheaper now than 50% uh, sweeter now than it was 20 years ago on average. So if you keep on hybridizing them, they become more and more sugar laden, which is really too bad. But luckily, pectin to the rescue. There's a good there's good pectin in there, which is the fiber which binds it. And uh, uh, if you've ever uh, laid your eyes on a real non-hybridized apple that's organic. It's a totally different ball game. No, it might not be quite as pretty as those fake apples out there, but wow, you can do something uh, with those. Um, nuts. Walnuts are among the best and almonds are among the best. Watch out for rancidity in peanuts, especially, <coughs> and aflatoxins in pistachios as well as peanuts. I just had a patient just come in with a horrible reaction to do the pistachios. She was all up in arms because she thought she was very allergic to pistachios now. I said no, it almost certainly was an aflatoxin, which is a mold, which is very toxic for the liver, and if you have a weak liver, it will affect you. Number one cause of death of infants in the Philippines, by the way. Yeah. Bananas, usually works out to be about 29 cents a piece. That's a cheap snack. And it can be very good for you. Very high in the glycemic index, mind you. Be careful. If you have sugar problems, be really careful with this one. For bonzo beans, broccoli. Broccoli, we mentioned before, is extremely anti-cancerous, and uh, if you don't like it, you're going to like it. <laughs> Watermelon, wild rice, beets, butternut squash, the whole grain pasta, sardines, spinach, tofu. Tofu, a lot of people are afraid of. This stuff doesn't taste like much, folks. It, as, it assumes the taste from the foods around you, around it. It's so easy to work with. And do make sure that the soy is not genetically modified, because that makes it 11 times as allergenic. Yeah? It changes the composition dramatically. So it's either organic or non-GMO tofu. Learn to like it. You can dice it. You can put it through anything, through your soup. You can stir fry with it. You can do anything you want with it. It's one of the easiest foods out there. Yes? I guess I, in learning to like tofu myself, I had someone tell me if I was trying to fit tofu into the standard American diet, it was never going to work. 
like, you know, the tofu dogs and tofu burgers and all that kind of thing. But if you are doing Asian-inspired recipes and things like that, and that is truly where we have come to really like it. Um, in Thai food, in um, different things like that, because the flavors just somehow, it just really works. And so I encourage you to keep that in mind, because I had some nasty experiences with tofu when I, I would have thought I hated it a couple of years yep. ago, but now I really yep. like it. So if you use it with stir fry, I also throw coconut milk in with it, mm -hmm. along with some pretty hot spices. It is so fun. You just mm -hmm. just freak your kids out with all kinds of weird looking things in there, and they like make it with their mouth, ah, that's hot, and you know, the discussion goes back and forth, and it's just fun. It really is. If you throw it in first with your spices, and then put all your vegetables in after it, that's when you'll get the most flavor out of your tofu, and you won't taste what is like true tofu just eating it. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing about uh, tofu, I was uh, uh, I, I took my wife out uh, last weekend to an, uh, a fairly new restaurant, uh, uh, Corez. It's um, Cherry Street, <laughs> close to the Greenwell, which also is a very nice restaurant. Uh, and it's all local, mostly organic, really weird foods, absolutely delicious. Um, I. Um, and I complimented the chef on it because uh, uh, both of us got two appetizers and spent 15 bucks each. Yeah, if you avoid the wine and the mixed drinks and all that with it, you just had a fantastic, very elegant, uh, top of the line kind of meal for 30 bucks. You, you can do this. You can do this on, on, uh, uh, on a budget for special occasions. And my wife ordered the dry rubbed tofu. It was just pieces of tofu that they had spiced with different spices, all kinds of bright colors, and then they had just thrown it in a can, in, in the in the pan, not in the can, <laughs> yeah, with with a little bit of heat, clarified butter, and had stir fried it, and then along with that there was some vegetables. It was a dish that was unbelievable. Yeah, it was it was really it was truly a great dish. Who would have thought? Yeah, and it was it was fairly hot, but it was uh, it was fun. So so the so you can do this on a budget. Notice that we didn't discuss meats all that much because meats are a side player. Yeah? In America, and it's part of a problem, it's the central player. And I'm almost aghast when you go to a more traditional restaurant, if I can call it that, that you get your plunk steak right in the center with a few little garnishes or vegetables along the side. It is not the way to eat. It is not the way to eat. Uh, when I first moved uh, to this area 21 years ago, uh, I'll tell you a little humor story to, to conclude this, is I was uh, from our church uh, invited to this barbecue, and uh, so yeah, great, let's get to know some people, so here we go with our young family, and, and they go to this barbecue, and they handed me this slab of meat, uh, uh, and I was aghast, because it filled my plate and beyond, so I go happily to my family and start cutting it up for them, Wrong. That was just for me. <laughs> yeah. So with my touch standards, I had no idea because in the Netherlands, if you're going to get steak, it is it is no much. I would say it's that big at the most, at the most, and it's three quarters, if not more, vegetables and some potatoes and maybe a little applesauce. That's a fairly traditional Dutch meal. So uh, it, it's it's amazing how our proportions are different here, uh, as well as calorie count also uh, being up. So um, these foods. And that's the comment that a patient of mine had this morning. Uh, Doc, my brain has never felt this bright in my whole life. It's about 45. I says, well, that's great. It just means you're getting healthier because your brain is part of your body, you know. It's not this separate little sphere just floating out in space somewhere. <laughs> Things reach it, nutrients reach it, and how this feels is how this is going to respond to it. Yeah? That's why sometimes by taking away a certain food, you can cure bipolar disorder in just two weeks. This is not just an aberrant occasional thing that I see. No, it's something we see all the time. Yeah? And I'm just naming one thing. And that's and these foods play a central role with patients like that. And that is what we're going to talk about next time. Specific mood issues. Your mood, your moods regarding depression, bipolar, schizophrenia. We're going to hit all those. And memory loss. And entire autistic spectrum disorder. There's a huge spectrum disorder. Uh, of, of autism out there, going from the severe to the very minor to just stunting of the intellect. And we're going to talk about that, how the gut talks to the brain and vice versa, and what chemicals do what. So that one will be more science, we're going to be throwing things at you, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have fun presenting that.